Good morning. My name is Mark Welsh. I'm the pastor here at Polk Street United Methodist Church. I'm so honored that you chose to worship with us. It's my prayer and all of our prayer that you would connect with God in a special way as together we worship the Lord in music, in word, and in deed. So I pray God's blessings on you this morning as together we lift up the name of our Lord. Good morning. Welcome to Polk Street United Methodist Church this morning on this beautiful fall morning. And welcome to those who are watching us through live streaming and who will be watching us through television. It's always wonderful to have everyone present no matter which, by which vehicle they're, they're getting here. I'd like to call your attention to the announcements while the ushers are passing out the registration pads. One uh, is the Polk Street Festival that's going to take place, the insert that is in there on October 27th. And on the other side is an announcement of the uh, UMW Annual Soup Luncheon on October 20th. As the registration pads are being given out, I hope that each one of you will take a moment and sign in and give us your name and your email address, especially if you're a guest here this morning. We contact people and, and we give information through emails and we would love for you to know about all of the happenings at Polk Street United Methodist Church. I invite you now to bow with me as we go before God in prayer. Oh God, we thank you for your presence here in this sanctuary on this morning as well as your presence all over the world where Christians everywhere are gathering in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to share in worship and communion on this very special Worldwide Communion Sunday. No matter where we live, no matter who we are in this life, no matter all of our differences in the way we look, in the way we live, in the way we think, we are all united with our love for you as the creator of the universe, the sustainer of everything we need in life, the giver of the Holy Spirit that keeps us, comforts us, and helps us to praise you this day in word, in song, and prayer. We humble ourselves before you as we dedicate our worship to you this morning. All of this we pray in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite Jennifer to come forward and lead us in our call to worship. Please stand and join me in our call to worship. Almighty God, from the ends of the earth, you have gathered us around Christ's holy table. Have mercy on your church and fill us with your grace. Amen. Please turn and greet those around you.
you hit the on button. Yeah, <laughs> usually, sometimes, I don't know. So, y'all doing okay today? Yes. yes, okay, very good. Well, today is World Communion Sunday, and many, many, many Christian churches across the world join us in celebrating World Communion Sunday. So, I wanna let y'all know, I worked really hard on this one, okay? I traveled the globe to find the breads for today, okay? All right, so my first stop was to France, okay? And in France, I got this right here, this French brioche. I think that's how you say that. If I'm wrong, sorry, but a French brioche. And see, and see here are the, um, the French children that I came across. See, I got pictures to prove, okay? <laughs> you are looking you're looking at me like you don't even believe me all right victoria will you go find a, a empty spot on that table and put that on the altar for me thank you ma'am my next stop was israel and i got some jewish rye bread yeah got some jewish rye bread here and here is a picture of a jewish boy so this is what a jewish boy may look like out, out there in israel okay and William, can you go find an empty spot on that table and put this in there for me? Thank you, sir. All right, next stop on my trip, I went to Italy. I went to the, to the Italian countryside and I got me some countryside Italian bread here, okay? And so here are some children. These are what some children may look like there in Italy, okay? In some traditional clothing, okay? All right, Piper, will you do me a favor? Will you go put this on the table for me and just find, just find a blank spot? Okay, next up on our trip, Greece. Greece, yes. We got some greasy bread there. No, not really. <laughs> we got pita. We got some pita bread here. It's a flat bread. That's kind of yummy. Have y'all had pita bread before? It's good. It does sound like pizza. You could probably make a pizza out of that too. And then I also got some Kalmata olive bread. This one's kind of cool looking. It looks kinda, almost like an S, doesn't it? That's kinda neat looking. Okay, so let's see here. Um, Lauren? Since you're right next to the table, will you put that up there for me? Max, will you put this pita? Mason, if you'll do my next one, okay? All right. So we went to Greece, and here's a picture of some children from Greece and some traditional clothing there, okay? Oh, thank you. You're keeping my papers. Thank you so much, Colin. You're a big help. Okay, and then my next stop was to Mexico, all right? And do y'all know what this is? Tortilla. A tortilla, yes. So tortilla. yummy. Yum, yum, yum. And then we got some pan del dulce, which means sweet bread. Yes. You like that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so, um, Mason, will you put the tortilla there? And Danny, will you put my pan del dulce over there for me? Thank you. It, kind of, it does look like there's Play-Doh on there. That's funny, but it does not taste like Play-Doh, I guarantee. And then, um, so here are some children in some traditional Mexican clothing there. Aren't they cute? So adorable. And then my last stop, and you know, because Texas, we all know Texas itself is a country itself. So I had to bring some Texas toast, right? Yes. <laughs> so I got me some Texas toast. And then, oh, look at this adorable child from Texas. Isn't she cute? Don't pay attention to this one on the corner there. She's not as cute. But this one right here. This was probably taken back in 1977, 78, something like that. Do you see that? Isn't she cute? Don't you agree? Yeah, I think that Look, was you. she looks sweet. What? I think that was you. Yeah, how did you know it was me? Because she was cute, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we traveled everywhere, right? Or we might have traveled down Georgia to the United over there on Georgia to get those breads. But so those breads, you know, they're all different. The children in those pictures, they look different than us. They may dress different from us, they eat different breads than us. But you know what? We all need the same Jesus, right? Yes, we all need the same Jesus. And in the book of John, chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says that he is the bread of life. And these breads that we had here, they can fill our belly for a little bit. And, you know, sometimes we can eat too much of the bread, right? Yeah, but you know what? We cannot have too much Jesus. He fills us up and satisfies us more than any bread could ever do. All right? Got it? And he's keto-friendly. 
right? <laughs> all right, so let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for all the children around the world who are celebrating World Communion Sunday. Thank you for being the bread of life, and help us remember that we need you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to our time of prayer, I invite you to once again look in the insert in the bulletin on the special events happening page and at the bottom. It lists the persons that I would ask you to remember in your prayer time in the coming week. And if you would please add the name of Sue Stevens, she's in the hospital. I invite you to bow with me as we go before God in prayer. Gracious God, you are the God of all nations. You are the giver of each one of our lives. You made us in your image, and yet each one of us is your unique creation. In the midst of the rich diversity of locations and seasons and humans, it is awesome that we gather in solidarity with all who call upon you this day through your Son, Jesus Christ. We will come to this holy meal wherever we are in the world, remembering that we are still one body in you. Even though we have different languages and different cultures and different traditions, even though we have different ways of worship and praying and praising, no matter where or what time, we drink of the cup in hope of new life. We pray that you would still our minds and quiet our hearts. We pray that you will open our ears and our hearts to hear the message brought to us by Pastor Mark as he tells us of your assurance that you are big enough for the world, even a fractured world. We confess at times, O oh Lord, that we fumble and we fall in our attempts to accomplish unity in our families and in our workplaces and in our schools and our neighborhoods, much less out in the larger world community. And yet, on this special Sunday, Worldwide Communion Sunday, Sunday that gives us eyes to recognize you your reflection in the eyes of Christians everywhere gives us a mind to accept and celebrate our differences, gives us a heart big enough to love you and your children everywhere. So this day we ask all of this through the grace, mercy, and tenderness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward as we prepare to give of our tithes and our offerings this day. We truly are blessed people with what we have given to us by God. And so this day, out of the generosity of our hearts, I ask you to give of your tithes and your offerings so that God's ministry and mission may go on in Amarillo and throughout the world. And I invite Jennifer to come forward and lead us in our offertory prayer. Please join me in our offertory prayer. O oh God, we join with our sisters and brothers around the world in remembering Christ's sacrifice for us, for the opportunity to eat and drink together, and for the life we have received. We give you thanks and praise. In the abundance of your many gifts, 
we now give a portion of those blessings back to you, that the world may know your name. Amen. Good morning. Our anthem this morning was written by a lady from Dallas who was a longtime member of the uh, Highland Park Church Choir and was educated at SMU. She wrote prolifically in church music and has hymns and service responses and, and included in many, many hymnals throughout Christendom. Her, her name is Jane Marshall. She, we lost her this year in, in May, last, last May, at the age of 94. And she's been one of my favorite composers for years. And we consider this piece the epitome of her compositions in church music, My Eternal King.
him is on 368, My Hope is Built. It's also in the bulletin. And be aware that we're singing the first and the third verses. And now together as God's people, let's read the word of our Lord that comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. This is a responsive reading. Let's read the word of our Lord. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. You may be seated. Well, welcome to the last Sunday in our sermon series, God is Big Enough. I've been humbled to hear stories of how you've applied that idea, those four little words, God is big enough, to yourself, to our families, sometimes the chaos that happens in all of our families, in our church, reviewing the history about where we've been, the ups, the downs, the victories, and the struggles, the United Methodist Church from our humble beginnings, and now today we'll focus on how God is big enough for our world. This week has been so refreshing with the rain. It reminds us just how big God is. I got six inches uh, of rain at my house. We were so blessed it take a long time for my sprinkler system to create that. So it's amazing just to remember how big God is, especially when it comes to weather. When we think about it, you know, when the world was created in six days, God was big enough to take care of every single detail all around our world, from the deserts to the beaches, to the mountains, to the lush gardens, to beautiful Amarillo and the Panhandle. 
God was big enough to handle all the meticulous details. And when you and I were created, he was able to create us good in God's sight. And that is the good news of the gospel, that God created us beautifully in his sight. And on the seventh day, even God rested. And God was big enough to make the world, and God was big enough to rest. And Adam and Eve, when they were in the garden, they had everything at their disposal. Everything was made just for them, except one little thing. And that one little thing is what they got. And if truth be told, we would do the same thing. It's called the human predicament. It's our human sinful nature. But God was big enough to handle the human predicament, able to handle the sin. And God was big enough to handle Adam and Eve. When Abraham wrestled with his son Isaac and took him up on the mountain and was called by God to sacrifice his one and only son, whom he loved dearly, but would do it because he gave everything to God, because he put God in his first in his life. That whatever God asked, he was willing to do because he served a big God. And when he lifted up that knife, the angel said, no, don't do what you're about to do because God's big enough to handle this. You have proved to us how much you love us. God was big enough to handle that discrepancy, that struggle that he had. God was big enough to handle his commitment. And God was also big enough. To handle Jacob when he wrestled with God. When he wrestled all night to receive God's blessings. Whether it was a man or an angel or God himself. Jacob overcame the man. And the only way the man got out was by touching the hip. And making him disabled in a, in a cer certain way. And Jacob became Israel. And a new nation, a new people were born. And God was big enough to handle the nation of Israel, even when they wandered, even when they forsook God, even when God showed up at, at the last minute, in just in time, when God showed up, the people could realize how big God was and how God was for them. When Goliath threatened God's people and threatened to annihilate them, God raised up a young boy named David and got some stones and through his slingshot slew Goliath and God's people were victorious and God was big enough to handle Goliath and God was big enough to handle that little boy David because that little boy grew up to be a king and he conquered so many in God's name and fought for God and he was this great king, mighty and victorious and God was big enough to handle him and his ego, because when he did sin in a very public and very ugly way with Bathsheba, and he even killed Bathsheba, whom he had an affair with, her husband, who was serving in his military. And he did it in a very bad way and was called out by Nathan and saying, how dare you? You have all this, and yet that one thing you couldn't leave alone. And when David repented of his sin and felt sorry and wore sackcloth and tore his clothes and said, God, forgive me, I have sinned. God was big enough to handle his affair. God was big enough to handle his sin. God was big enough to handle his discrepancies and his proclivities because God was big enough to guide him, this man whose heart was after God. And when Job had everything that you could want, and served God faithfully, all of a sudden, had no income. His family was gone. All of a sudden, his health started deteriorating. God was big enough to handle it, even when he questioned. When he said, God, where are you? I've done everything that you want me to do. And my friends are telling me that I've sinned. Where have I sinned, oh God? And he struggles. And that's when God says, where were you? When I made the foundations of the earth, where were you from the beginning? Where were you? And he restores him twice what he had after Job had prayed for his friends who gave him wrong counsel. God was big enough to handle the discrepancies. God was big enough to handle the pain. God was big enough to handle some of those things that he just didn't understand. God could handle it. And God could handle Daniel 
who served God faithfully when King Darius threw him into the lion's den. And as he was in the lion's den with these hungry lions, God was big enough to protect Daniel as he stood for God. When the king woke up and went and unsealed the seal, Daniel was there, alive. And he yanked him out. He said, your God is the true God. And those who had tricked the king into throwing Daniel into the lion's den were thrown into the lion's den. And the scripture says they didn't even touch the ground. The lions were so hungry and chomped them up. God was big enough to protect Daniel. God was big enough to bless and guide Daniel as he stood for God. And God was big enough to handle Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When King Nebuchadnezzar made a, a graven image, made a gold image, and had everyone bow down to the image. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, we bow down to the one God, to the bigger God, to the creator, not the creation. And at that, King Nebuchadnezzar threw them into the fire, the fiery furnace that was just ablaze. And as King Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fire, he said, I not only see the three, I see another one. And he is like the Son of Man, all lit up. But, my friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. They didn't have one hair singed. They didn't even smell like fire. God was big enough to protect them in the fire, in their struggles. That God was with them. And when it seemed for 435 years that God was silent, it seemed that no prophecies were given. It seemed that God was dead. God was big enough to handle the darkness, the pain, the crimes, and some of the forsakenness. And yet God was big enough when a little baby was born, fully man and fully God, was born in a lowly stable, the lowest of the lowest places on earth. That God was big enough to deliver a child to save the world. And Jesus came and he healed and he taught and he blessed. And he helped people who were on the outside. The disenfranchised, he challenged the religious leaders. He hung out with prostitutes and he gave grace to all. And God was big enough to handle that society, the church. God was big enough to handle Jesus. And when Jesus, God's one and only Son, was given to sacrifice for us, when he died, that gruesome death was mocked. God was big enough in that darkness. God was big enough to take on the sin of the whole world throughout all of eternity. And when he died, he rose again because God was bigger than death. God gave victory over death and took the sting out of that death. God was big enough because Jesus rose again. He appeared to many and the church was born. And as the, the spirit of the Lord moved throughout the church, God gathered people and called people to his name. And as they met, it became illegal to become a Christian. And people were persecuted, but God was big enough to handle the persecutions. God was big enough to empower those people as they met in the catacombs. And as they, they give everything for the sake of Christ, God was big enough. And when they were persecuted because of their faith in Jesus, when they died, when they were burned at the stake, when they were excluded, when their businesses failed because they were simply Christians and no one would buy anything from a Christian, when they had to make an ichthus in the sand because proclaiming Christ meant you, you would go to jail. When they were harassed because of Jesus, it simply reminds us that God is big enough. God was big enough for them at that time, at that place. And when the church rose up and became an institution, where it became the law to become a Christian, and when the crusades came out, and when they expanded the church, God was big enough to handle the church the institution, the differences of power. 
And when the Bible was printed for everyone to read, not just the priests, not just a select few, but when everyone had access to God's Word, God was big enough for intellectual inquiry. God was big enough to let even the most uneducated person read the Word of the Lord, that God could move through the Word that just didn't have to be interpreted by one person or by a set of people. God was big enough to handle the Word of God going out to ordinary people like you and me. And when the, when the church rose up as this institution and others that were Christian protested the power of the church, this institution, and Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis on the church door and said, God is accessible to anyone, that we can go to God directly. We don't have to go to a priest. We don't have to go to a certain way to do it. We can simply ask the Lord and pray to God and receive forgiveness right away. God was big enough in the protest movement, in the Protestant Reformation. God was big enough. And when the United Methodist Church began in humble beginnings with John Wesley, when John Wesley was snatched from the burning building, and when God strangely warmed his heart, God was big enough to handle him. In 1888, when Polk Street was founded, God was big enough to be with those traveling pastors, with that small group of faithful Christians who met and worshipped right here in Amarillo. God was big enough when you and I were born. Maybe that was a couple years ago. Maybe that was a long time ago. God was big enough to handle us with our parents, maybe with our honoriness, with our rebellious natures, sometimes with our education. God was with us every step of the way, whether we realized it, whether we acknowledged it, and God brought us to a certain time and a certain place to say yes to him. And then God brings us along little by little, surrounding us with Christians that help support us, give us that grace and that mercy, but also give us direction and help. That God was big enough to handle our sin, our struggles, but also God's big enough to handle our families, our kids, when they act up, when we're not all that we could be as parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. That God provides financially, that God provides morally, that God's help, God helps us in the church to raise our kids in the way that li- leads to life eternal. That God was big enough. So today, in our world, God is big enough for the world. The world is so diverse, has different religions, different worldviews, different ideologies, different economics, different ethical frameworks. The world is so diverse if you think about it. And yet God is big enough for our world, that God is living and moving in the church and all around us. God, my friends, is big enough as the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer. And we can't even imagine or even fathom how big God is. So just think for a second. The 7 billion people in the world just today, not all over eternity, not all over since the beginning of man, but 7 billion people today, if you and I were the only people on earth, Jesus still would have died for me. And for you. God is cosmic, but God is personal. That God's big enough to handle me and my sin and my struggles and my purpose. But the world needs us. The world needs the church to raise up as servant leaders, to give grace and mercy, to be the good news in our businesses, in our schools and our families. That's why at the United Methodist Church, pretty much a portion of everything that we give, roughly 10 percentage, goes to what we call apportionments or shared ministry givings, and goes to the United Methodist Committee on Relief, to a lot of people who are on the ground helping when tragedy ensues, but also to help the church in a global sense. We are a, a church that tries to reach the world for Jesus Christ, to transform the world with the good news of the gospel, not only in our apportionments, not only what we give through shared ministries, we personally will be taking a mission trip 
to Costa Rica next summer. Our youth go on mission trips every summer. And we have local missions that thrive, that feed hungry kids, that bless so many. And so many ministries in town have started at Polk Street. We are for the world knowing Jesus Christ. We're also for Amarillo knowing Jesus Christ. So this morning, I would simply like to propose to you that on this World Communion Sunday, when we celebrate with millions, if not billions of Christians around the world, that God is big enough. Jesus said in John 10.10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you might have life and have it to the full. That God is big enough for our world and for you and me to bring us that beautiful life that God created us to have. Now, when we claim the promise that God is big enough, it doesn't mean that we're ignorant. It doesn't mean that, that we're giving a pass that we just don't know. Oh, my friends, we usually know, we all usually know all too well. But we are modeling and following that model that Paul has for us. That we are simply humbly confident in that good news of God. That we don't have all the answers. And yet the answers are found in Christ. That God is big enough to handle us, our church, and our lives. And so we are humble servants of the beautiful God that created us, redeemed us, and sustains us. And that God of the cosmos is our Lord and Savior. Let us never forget, my friends, that God is big enough. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you that you are big enough to handle differences, struggles, sins, victories. Lord, thank you that you are a personal God. So now as we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion with our brothers and sisters around the world, Lord, may you continue to invite us into wondering about you, about seeking you, about being your people in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now please join me as together we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table. All who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with God and with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. I invite you to join me as we read responsibly the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed are you, your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism, his suffering of death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, 
and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat this, in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup again, he returned, thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink this, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, as together now we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on us. Gathered here out of love for you and all his gifts of bread and wine. May they be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we might be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry and service to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet forever. Just as there are different breads here, we are different. But we come together as one body of Christ because Christ broke his body that we might receive wholeness, shed his blood, that we might receive the forgiveness of our sins both now and forevermore. So through your Son, Jesus Christ, in your holy church, in your Holy Spirit, all honor and power is yours, Almighty God, both now and forevermore. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now with those who are assisting us as we serve Holy Communion, come forward now as we prepare our hearts for our Holy Communion. If this morning you would like a gluten-free sacrament, they are available to you right over here. We want everyone to be able to come and receive this sacrament. This isn't a United Methodist table. This is a Christian table. So if you desire Christ in your life, if you would like to partake of this Holy Sacrament, you are invited now. So together, as God's people, let's celebrate Holy Communion. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this great mystery. Thank you for your love for us, both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, amen. Please stand now as we sing our very last song together.
Our choir was wonderful this morning. No, Paul and uh, George and all of our choir. Let's praise the Lord for our choir. Thank you all for your leadership. And forgive us for going a little bit long. Uh, we're sorry, but uh, I hope that as you walk out, you take one of these bracelets, if you don't have one, and share this message with those outside of these walls. So if we'll grab hands with the person next to us. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. Thank you that we could partake of this holy sacrament with millions, if not billions, all around the world. As we go forth, may we rest in the promise that you are big enough with whatever meets us when we walk out these doors. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.